everyone. Uh, so this is the second half of, of the scientific lecture part of our 2018 annual Canadian educational meeting. Hopefully, hopefully, our first of many annual educational meetings. I, I hope, you know, looking looking back at how, how scientific conferences and, and uh, uh, events of this kind get started, they usually start very humbly and then 20 years later, there's a thousand attendees filling up the conference space in San, San Diego. So I, I hope that you will join us in San Diego, or where, where can we have it in, well, we'll have it here still in Canada. But, but I hope, you know, maybe our annual meeting, it'll be in a big, big place, full of many, many, many attendees. But, you know, we're, we're, we're starting small because everything has to start small. Okay, so in the first half we talked about uh, what we know about mefloquine today and then sort of what we knew before, but now let's get into more of the details, the, uh, a little bit more about mefloquine's development and then the, the clinical aspect of, of this condition we call mefloquine poisoning. So in, in the aftermath of World War II, what I didn't get to was, was that what came out of that was this new drug chloroquine. And I don't really talk a lot about chloroquine, but chloroquine's a big part of this, and maybe later we'll talk about chloroquine. But chloroquine, there were problems with it, namely the the parasite was getting resistant to chloroquine. So the army had to develop a new drug around the, the time of the Vietnam War. And so they had a second antimalarial drug development project, a mini, mini malaria project. And out of that, this project that began in the early 1960s came uh, mefloquine. Uh, but during the development of mefloquine, during the, during the, the uh, studies that led to mefloquine's early synthesis, there were a number of other drugs related to mefloquine that were studied. Now mefloquine, is slightly different than the drugs that were studied in World War II, the ones that caused all that neurotoxicity. Uh, those were eight aminoquinolines, mefloquine, and these other drugs are four quinoline methanols. They're still quinolines. And my point is that this entire broad class is neurotoxic, but e even, even if you argue that point, that they're slightly different, we should have known that four quinoline methanols were neurotoxic because there was early evidence that these drugs had the same effect. This is Schmidt, the famous Dr. Schmidt from the World War II era studies. And this drug, they found that doses evoked lightheadedness, difficulties in focusing, headache and nausea. And it's the difficulties in focusing that should have been, uh, that should have clued them in because that's evidence of brainstem dysfunction. Difficulties in focusing, it's a, it's a problem mediated by a specific cranial nerve. Uh, and early during mefloquine's development, they saw evidence of dizziness uh, at high uh, doses. And I think what they assumed, the folks that didn't know about uh, the neurotoxicity of the broader class, they just assumed it was a, um, a quinine-like effect because quinine, the naturally occurring drug quinine, is known to cause dizziness. And actually there's, a, there's the name of the disorder caused by poisoning by quinine used to be quinism. That's what they called it. It was quinism. And then they also called it synchronism. And for whatever reason, synchronism became the term for poisoning by quinine. It was a well-defined syndrome, a giddiness, lightheadedness, confusion, tinnitus, um, vertigo. You guys know because you've experienced it. That's, that's synchronism. But a, a synonym for it was quinism. Quinism fell into disuse because synchronism was more popular. So we have, we have used, we have resurrected the term quinism and repurposed quinism to, dis to describe the broader disease caused by poisoning by quinolines, not just quinine, but, but all uh, quinolines. So, so synchronism is a form of quinism. And the neuropsychiatric symptoms caused by quinolines, neuropsychiatric quinism, but since it's the problem most people worry about, you can just call it quinism. Or chronic quinoline encephalopathy if you want to impress your, your doctor. So, so Schmidt, um, and it is. I mean, that's it's what it is. It's a chronic encephalopathy caused by quinoline. It's a perfect, perfectly acceptable term, or CQE. So Schmidt, the fellow that warned us about, about the neurotoxicity of drugs of this class, this fellow is a very, very sneaky fellow. I, I think he knew what was going on all along. But because he had lots of government contracts, he didn't want to bite the hand that, that fed him. And, and read what it says here. He said, mefloquine promises, he, he, this is early, during the testing of mefloquine. Mefloquine promises to be broadly useful, both in treating established infections and for routine suppressive purposes, meaning preventing malaria. If this promise is not realized, 
it will doubtless not be for lack of anti-malarial activity, but rather because of toxicological attributes not identified in the small-scale studies pursued to date. Now, what he's saying in the context, remember what he said, he said, a careful search for central nervous system lesions is highly desirable. And Schmidt is saying, you know, it's possible this drug will be found to be too toxic for use. And if that's the case, it's because you didn't study it enough before you started using it in man. And what was Schmidt telling us to do? Neurotoxicity testing, right? He knew all along. Schmidt knew all along. I'm almost certain that he knew all along of the problems with, with methylamine. Um, and he probably couldn't say anything, but he left enough for us. He left enough in his papers for us to sort of pick up the torch and, and, and carry it on. Um, but it's, it's really sad because this was 1978 that he published this, so we could, have, we could have avoided this. But I think Schmidt knew the politics behind the development of drugs of this class. You know, there's very, very powerful interests behind the development of these drugs, and, and I don't think anything was going to stop nephilim. Remember what he said, their capacity to evoke reactions, which might mask symptoms of low-grade neuronal injury, plus the likelihood of their widespread use in malaria therapy, make a detailed search for central nervous system lesions highly desirable. And unlike all of the testing that was done on these drugs in World War II, where they gave them to monkeys and they chopped the brain stems up and looked under the microscope to see if the drugs were causing brain stem injury, guess what they forgot to do with mefloquine? They never once did any sort of monkey neurotoxicity testing. And they will say, well, because it's a different class of drug. It's a four quinoline methanol. It's not an eight amino quinoline. Uh, but that's beside the point because it's, it's all drugs of the class that have this property, not just eight amino quinolines. So uh, here is one of the earliest pieces of clinical evidence that mefloquine itself was having these same psychiatric effects. This is a fellow, uh, 1988 experienced an attack of amnesia with a uh, treatment dose of, oh no, uh, yeah, this is, this is with a preventive dose of mefloquine. Uh, soon after that, three cases of confusion were reported, acute brain syndrome, uh, transient memory disturbance uh, with treatment of malaria. What, what these folks were describing uh, was, was toxic encephalopathy. That, that's what they were describing. They, they were describing encephalopathy caused by mefloquine with, with disturbance of cognition and symptoms of vertigo. Vertigo, feelings of intoxication, instability, and insomnia. The very same things that were reported with use of adabrin, the same sort of symptoms that are indicative of brainstem and limbic system neurotoxicity that we saw with drugs uh, tested during World War II. And this was all around the time that mefloquine was being licensed in the United States and a couple other jurisdictions. The train was barreling down the tracks at 80 miles an hour and nothing, even these reports, was gonna stop it. Here's a, a, a publication that came out right around the time that mefloquine was undergoing uh, licensing. Uh, reports of psychosis. Psychosis is a side effect and 4% of the patients treated is a serious problem, especially in treatment outside of the hospital. Another understatement. Look, symptoms of delusions, aggressive behavior, confusion, visual hallucinations. So we knew everything back in 1989 that we know today. Right? We, this, this was all very apparent that the drug shared the liability uh, to neuropsychiatric effects of other drugs of the quinoline class. The World Health Organization was initially very concerned about this. They published this, this, this uh, report alerting the world to these problems. Um, but... The, the, the military and the malariology community and the organized interests fought back. And how they fought back was with, uh, was with a strategy of uh, manufacturing debt, as I mentioned before. And what they, what they did was they buried the important warnings that would provide them legal protection. Um, they gave them cover. Uh, and it appears that they worked almost, it almost looks like they intentionally attempted to undermine these warnings at the same time, which is, which is not atypical. This is, this is what organizations do. 
uh, because the, the, the undermining can be denied. But as long as you have the words here written in black and white, you're, you're safe, I think, from a legal, legal perspective. So, so when, when Mefflin was licensed in the United States, the manufacturer conceded that it had these adverse effects. And they warned during prophylactic use, if signs of unexplained anxiety, depression, restlessness, or confusion are noticed, these may be considered prodromal to a, quote, more serious event. In these cases, the drug must be discontinued. Not should, must be discontinued. So, so Roche is saying in 1989, here's a drug that we're going to be selling to the military. We're going to be giving it to people going overseas where they're going to be shot at. And if you experience anxiety, and, and not if you experience anxiety that you or someone else attributes to the drug, during prophylactic use, if signs of unexplained anxiety, depression, restlessness, or confusion are noted, these may be considered prodromal to a more serious event. That's not, they're not saying if, if, if you're shown to have a confirmed drug reaction. They're saying if you basically develop these symptoms, stop taking the drug, right? So, so you, can, you can make a point many, many years after, looking back with clarity on this, you can say, how, how do they expect to use this drug? In, in military settings. And, and also, if, if, you're, if you're miles away from medical care in the jungle and you have no way of contacting a doctor to get an alternative anti-malarial drug, what are you supposed to do? If, if you're hundreds of miles away from medical care in the jungles of Sub-Saharan Africa and you develop restlessness how, or confusion, if you develop confusion, how are you supposed to get a different anti-malarial drug? Right? It, it, it's profoundly... People reading this should have known never to use the drug. But arguably, any doctor, any pharmacist that read this and took it seriously should have known this was, this was fundamentally defective for the indication that it was marketed for. This is a fundamentally defective product because it just makes no sense. You, can't, you cannot prescribe this drug safely to people that are traveling. You can't, right? So, in a, in a way, they, they, they tried to protect themselves with this language, right? The onus is now on the prescriber. Roche can say, well, we warned you, right? You're, you know, why didn't you tell your, your patients? Um, but, at the same, but at the same time that this language was in the product insert, uh, sponsored, sponsored doctors, folks, folks that worked for uh, 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 travel medicine bodies and so on, they, 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 they undermine this warning by suggesting that these symptoms are just a normal part of travel, right? If you experience insomnia, well, of course you experience insomnia. That's normal, you're traveling. And the occasional visual hallucination, well, we know travelers do drugs, right? And they, they would try to attribute these, these symptoms to anything but the drug. And we see it today with, with a drug related to mefloquine that's being marketed. Well, we know that people that deploy on humanitarian missions, they, they experience symptoms of PTSD. It's the PTSD, it's not the drug. They want to blame everything but the drug. But this drug is neurotoxic. It has the exact same liability that other drugs of the class has. And it, it, it was only in the early 2000s that the government paid for testing that demonstrated this neurotoxicity in an animal model. And this is not an ideal animal model. It's a, a murine model. Um, they, didn't, they still didn't test it in monkeys, which is, which is really what they should be doing. But this showed that mefloquine has the same liability that other quinolines have to causing focal neurotoxicity uh, in the brainstem, permanent in nature. And the great irony here is that the lead author of this paper, Jeffrey Dow, is now CEO of a drug company that's marketing a drug very similar to mefloquine. It, you can't make this stuff up. It's, it's absolutely... <coughs> Uh, re remarkable, but then again, who better than someone who studies the neurotoxicity of these drugs to market a drug and claim it's not neurotoxic? It's actually it's fairly brilliant, actually. Um, but we know now that mefloquine is problematic. There's very very few people in the malariology or, or, or drug safety community would argue mefloquine's not problematic. We have evidence of, of, of focal neurotoxicity from mefloquine from that one study. We have uh, in vitro evidence, meaning meaning test tube evidence, that mefloquine kills uh, brain cells, and that's not a small matter. Not every substance is neurotoxic. Mefloquine is neurotoxic. And we have clinical correlation, which is key. Clinical correlation is key, because, because if you have one or two case reports 
that show a very unusual and distinct finding. Um, and the, and you, have, you have a solid biological basis, or you have a very plausible pathophysiology based on separate evidence. This is, this is very, very strong evidence. And it was really only a handful of cases, including this one, which is a, a, a fellow that I saw when I was in the military that I, that I published that led to drug regulators around the world realizing we have a problem, connecting the dots, realizing that the findings from animal model studies in World War II had significance to understanding the case reports that we were seeing coming out with mefloquine, linking it all together. It's really just a handful of cases. One or two cases published in the literature can, can often um, uh, make tr tremendous progress in, in drug safety. Mefloquine is a classic example. Ten years earlier, the FDA had reviewed a series uh, of reports of, of possible brainstem dysfunction related to mefloquine, but they dismissed it because I think they didn't realize that studies back in World War II had shown the drug had this effect on the brainstem. I, I, honestly, I think they just didn't do their homework. I think they didn't look in the archives and, and find Schmidt's papers. But what I did was I went back and I went through the archives and I said, wait a second, this is, this is nothing new. We've known about this effect. We've known that drugs of this class can cause focal injury to the brainstem and that the signs and symptoms that we see with clinical use reflect the localization of that brainstem injury. And that's what I wrote about in, the, in this, in this uh, report. Uh, and soon after I published this, FDA opened up an investigation, and within about a year, the box warning came out. But they, they should have known this much, much earlier. And what I did was I, I took a look at, uh, I took a look at all the adverse event reports that had been submitted for all the various antimalarial drugs. So, so folks report different symptoms with, with, with uh, mefloquine, chloroquine, uh, uh, malarone, or atovaquone proguanol. Uh, and doxycycline, and I, I wanted to see if, if I could tease out what the syndrome was. I, I wanted to tease out if, if there was a, a signal coming out of all of these reports. And, and, and this, was one of, this was one of the papers that went into my uh, doctoral uh, thesis. So, so uh, very agnostically, meaning without um, sort of an a priori theory, I, I, just, I looked for evidence of a, a, a neuropsychiatric syndrome from anti-malarials in general. So I put all the anti-malarial drug adverse event reports into a hat, uh, and I did some statistical work where basically you shake it up and all the neuropsychiatric reports go over here and all the gastrointestinal reports go over here and all the skin reports go over here. It's just a sort of a magic thing you do with statistics. It's called latent class analysis for those watching. Latent class analysis, a very powerful statistical tool in psychiatric epidemiology. And so I shook everything up and I took the it's like cleaving nature at its joints when you do latent class analysis. You, you just find the natural divisions and things. And I took the neuropsychiatric reports, and sure enough, most of the neuropsychiatric reports were from mefloquine. That's not surprising. But some were from other, other drugs. But what I found was, was that the symptoms that went into this syndrome definition were precisely those that were reported during early use of mefloquine. And in fact, precisely those that were reported during early use of adamant back in the day, this delirium with psychosis, memory problems, some neurological problems, and prodromal symptoms, the things like sleep disturbance, anxiety, depression, abnormal dreams. So this convinced me, This and, and, and nowhere did I use mefloquine as a covariant. I just threw all the adverse event reports in and this thing came out. And you get the, this, this remarkable, uh, in, in, in my field, in epidemiology, when you get an odds ratio of two, meaning something is twice as likely with this exposure as another exposure, when you get an odds ratio of two, that's pretty good. You can publish that stuff. When you get an odds ratio of nine, a thousand, that, that something's going on there. You know? And this is, not, this is good science. I got a doctoral degree from Johns Hopkins from this. If this was wrong, they would have grilled me and I would have never got out of my, my, uh, my exam. So this is good stuff. This, this is evidence of a disease. This is, this is how we define diseases in, in psychiatry, in medicine, is we throw all these symptoms into a pot, we shake them up, and we see which symptoms lump together. And when signs and symptoms lump together, and you have a reason they lump together, right? Common exposure, 
and the exposure is known to cause a certain kind of pathology, what you have is you have a disease. And so this, this, the, this work that I did convinced me that mefloquine poisoning is actually a disease. It, it, it's, it's a pathological condition with a known cause, a known pathophysiology, and very clearly defined signs and symptoms. So, so this tells me mefloquine poisoning is a disease. And we should have known this all along, right? Because the, the acute side effects of, of mefloquine are consistent, and they're consistent with what we see in other members of the class, right? The, the, the acute side effects of, of, of mefloquine, they can be thought of as sort of progressing along a, a continuum. They start typically, not always, sometimes it's just boom, full on case of psychosis, but typically you get these, these subtle symptoms starting off, insomnia, vivid dreaming, nightmares, uh, a sense of unease, foreboding, People say, I just feel dark, I feel evil, something's not right, I feel like I've changed. The anxiety, depression, restlessness, or confusion that were hinted at in the 1989 product insert. This can progress to full-on paranoia, thinking everyone's out to get you, persecutory delusions, mania, mania, and you often don't notice mania, right? Try to get someone who's manic to go to the doctor. The last thing they're gonna do is go to the doctor because they're feeling great. They're getting everything done, they're having a great time, they don't feel sick. And people love manic people because they're fun to be around. So mania is a very difficult symptom to identify. You know, you're just a high performing guy when you're manic. But mania is, is very often a defining feature of this condition and it's missed, it's completely missed. Hallucinations are less, less likely to be missed because if, if you report seeing a monster sitting in that chair, your buddies will usually call you out on it. So hallucinations are typically easier to recognize. Uh, amnesia, meaning, meaning you either forget things in the distant past or you're incapable of forming new memories at that time. Retrograde versus anterograde amnesia. Dissociation, a feeling like you're just, you're just not there. Or a sense of observing the world from a different point. A lot of people will attribute this to PTSD, right? But, but you, you experience dissociation in, in, the, in the grip of a, acute mefloquine psychosis very often. Uh, depersonalization, derealization, aspects of that. And then what many of you will attest to in private, extreme bouts of anger, aggression, rage, and then maybe more subtly irritability, uh, and just a general feeling of, of not wanting to be around other people. And of course, um, uh, suicidal and homicidal ideation, often ex very compulsive. Right, and, and many of you will attest to the fact that on some occasions you've had to stop yourself from compulsively jumping off a building or in front of a car. It just comes over you, and boom, you want to you want to just kill yourself. Um, has anyone seen that movie, The Happening? Do, 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 you know, do you know what I'm talking about? The Happening, the M. It's a it's a it's a B movie. It's supposed to be funny, like B movies are. But it's, it's actually very remarkable um, how similar this story is to what many people report to me. So, so very quickly, as an aside, the premise of the happening was that <clears throat> nature was upset with us, humanity, for destroying the world. And so the plants conspired to take us out. And what the plants did was they, they, they released this neurotoxin. And it's not a neurotoxicant because if it's a plant compound, it's a neurotoxin. A man-made substance is a neurotoxicant. And neurotoxins are neurotoxicants, but neurotoxins natural, neurotoxicants synthetic. So, so the plants release a neurotoxin that comes off like, like clouds of pollen. And then whatever people are in the, in the way of this cloud of plant neurotoxin just have, have this sudden compulsion to kill themselves. And, and in this movie, you see these these horrific scenes of people just doing the most grim things to kill themselves in, in the control of, of this drug. And people have told me this is not unlike what they've experienced with this drug, this sudden compulsion to do violence unto themselves. And, and, and when you ask them, well, what were you thinking? They said, well, I just wanted to know what it was like. What, like, what do you mean you, you were curious about what it would feel like to commit suicide? Yes, I was just curious. I just had this, this sudden compulsion of curiosity, like I was driven to do it. Very disturbing, very, very, very disturbing. Um, and undoubtedly, 
Undoubtedly, there have been many, many, many such episodes, and I think we can think of some in recent Canadian history uh, where, where this fits it to a T. All of these symptoms, right, will know if you're susceptible to these because they typically occur within the first few doses. And, and, and during the break, we talked about this. One pill is often enough. One tablet can often cause this, but, but in general, one, you start to see the prodromal symptoms, and then if you keep taking it, two, three, four tablets, this is when it'll become severe, and potentially at that point, uh, 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 permanent. Very quickly, th this association with, with uh, uh, acts of violence has, has been known for quite some time. When you look at the drugs that are associated with acts of violence, it's things like amphetamines, right? Um, the SSRIs, um, uh, Vereniclin, which is, which is the smoking cessation drug, uh, bupropion. Um, these, these drugs are all psychotropic <coughs> drugs. These are all drugs that are indicated for treatment of psychiatric condition. The one drug that isn't a psychotropic drug, at least tech, you know, by conventional definition, is mefloquine. But it's right smack there in the middle of the list, which again is why I think of this drug as a psychotropic drug that has incidental antimalarial properties. It would almost be as if, you know, imagine if amphetamines just happened to cure malaria, right? That's basically what we have here, right? It's basically what we have. So the, 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 the syndrome that we characterized, that I characterized in that, in that paper, and then what we, what we know from, uh, from the acute adverse effects, because, because now we recognize these, these, these acute effects, they don't go away for the most part symptoms that you experience with use of the drug, for the most part, can continue for weeks, two months, two years, two decades, sometimes without uh, any break. And, and others, others will develop uh, later, but, but many of the same symptoms that were experienced during the prodrome continue unabated. And let's just go through some of these. So people report, um, this, this is probably one of the big ones, just a change in personality. They, they come home just feeling different, right? They just feel like they're a different person. Their, their spouse or their, or their family members will say, you're different, something's different about you since, since coming home. Sleep disturbances. People will tell me, I have not had a good night's sleep since 1996 when I took methylene. I used to sleep like a baby and I've never slept well since. And it all started after the second pill of mefloquine. And it could either be a primary insomnia or it could be an insomnia that's linked to these horrific nightmares that persist. And, and then it could also be linked to the apnea that we think is also associated with, with this. Um, neuro, neurocognitive changes. Uh, and, and, and this is all mediated by the hippocampus, the deep part of your limbic system. Um, the, the, the pattern of deficits that are best associated with this drug, we still have to work out a little bit, but certainly uh, on neurocognitive testing, there, there seems to be some patterns that emerge. Um, spatial and working memory, your ability to concentrate on tasks, um, uh, just the ability to focus, right? People will say, I'm just having a hard time focusing. Uh, and it might be subtle, right? In, in some people, it's subtle um, to the point where, where if you have an unsympathetic examiner on neurocognitive testing, they may say, well, it's just a normal variant, but people know they were high performing before mefloquine and a 10%, 20% per, uh, percentile decrement in functioning to a neuropsychologist might not be a big deal, but to that individual, that's the difference between having been an A student and now only being able to get C's in school. Uh, so there's definitely something going on there. And then neurological problems. So, so a big issue that emerges later on in this toxidrome is vestibulopathy. Uh, and, and, and it's easy to misattribute this to a peripheral cause. The, your balance sense, what allows you to do this incredible thing, which is amazing that you can do this even with your eyes closed. This is remarkable. So, so, so many signals have to be processed in your brainstem and cerebellum to be able to do this. Uh, if, if this doesn't work, it's often attributed to a, a peripheral vestibular dysfunction. Your, your, your inner ear canals, your, your semicircular canals, uh, that provide your uh, kind of like gyroscopic location mm -hmm. sense. But with mefloquine, we don't think that's what's being affected. We think this is a brainstem problem. So we think that the vestibular nuclei, the, por the portions of your brainstem that integrate this sensory information, 
are damaged, and so they're not able to function properly. It's a central form of vestibulopathy, often with central vertigo, meaning a sense of motion that's mediated not by your uh, semicircular canals, but by your brainstem. Um, this equilibrium is a little more subtle because uh, your position sense and your ability to control your eyes uh, and move your eyes in reaction to movement of your head, that's purely vestibular. But the ability to maintain balance on uh, uneven ground uh, and to keep your balance like this, uh, there's a lot of position sense coming from my foot telling me, okay, you're putting a lot of pressure on the outside, now you're putting a lot of pressure on the inside. And if those tracks are damaged, if, if the portions of your brainstem and, and spinal cord that process those signals are damaged, uh, then, then you won't have vertigo, you'll have disequilibrium. And there are special tests, uh, posturography tests, that can help uh, disentangle some of this stuff. This is abnormal in cases of methylene poisoning, but it's central, it's, it's brainstem. It's not this part, it's, it's brainstem. But what goes with this? There's all sorts of things that go with this. Um, and we were having a good talk about this earlier. So agoraphobia, many people are familiar with the concept of agoraphobia, not being able to leave the house, um, being afraid of crowds, being freaked out by busy environments, busy, loud environments. Uh, we were at uh, uh, Starbucks and, and it was just a little too much for some of the folks I was with because there was just too much going on, too much noise, too many people moving around, made, made them anxious. So we went outside where it was quieter, a lot better. Why is that? Were, were, they, were they freaking out because they were afraid that someone in the building might be a threat to them? No, it, it, wasn't, a, it wasn't a specific avoidance behavior. It was a non-specific avoidance behavior. There was just something uncomfortable about the environment. It was very non-specific. So we went outside and everything's better. Um, but it's very easy to see how that could be interpreted as a symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder. It has nothing to do with post-traumatic stress disorder. What was going on was these folks' vestibular systems, their vestibular ocular systems, were being overwhelmed by inputs. And they were freaking out the exact same way that, imagine if this is a cliff. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a line here. And imagine I'm on the edge of a cliff, right? And I'm walking up to the, the edge here, and I look over, and all I see is a distant horizon, and I see these, these long lines going down to whatever, you know, the, the bottom of this mile-long canyon. What do I experience? Panic, right? I experience acute panic. I experience acute anxiety. I might start sweating. I experience fear. And what do I want to do? I want to get away from that, right? Now, why, why would I be experiencing this fight-or-flight reaction from just looking at something? And you can actually induce this by looking at photos. You can watch a video that induces the same panic-like reaction. It's mediated by, by your vestibular system. Your body is telling you this is a dangerous situation. Get away because you could die, right? This is good. This is not pathological. It's good. But if, if your vestibular system is damaged, then you may experience the same sense of panic, not at the edge of a cliff, but at your local Starbucks or when you're in your supermarket walking down these aisles and the flickering fluorescent lights and the, the long straight aisles and the people moving around, you lose your, you lose your horizon, you lose your sense of orientation, uh, you feel like you're about to fall. And what do you experience? A panic attack. And then you go tell your psychiatrist, I just had a panic attack. Well, where were you? In the supermarket. Oh, you have agoraphobia. And they never think about the vestibular cause. This is not a problem that's unique to, to folks suffering methylene poisoning. Folks with uh, Meniere's disease, uh, BPV, v, other uh, peripheral vestibular problems. The vestibular community is very aware of this problem. But among military veterans, it's very likely that these, these avoidant type behaviors that are purely situational and entirely attributable to vestibular decompensation will be attributed to PTSD. It's very, it's very easy to, to do that. Um, so, so one, one, there, there are many environments like this, and you, and, and you can probably list your own. We, we can do this in a private session, but, but uh, the, the typical ones that go with agoraphobia, driving through tunnels over bridges, um, being in crowds, walking through crowds, being in uh, sports stadiums, um, really being anywhere where people are walking around. 
These driving are triggers the vehicle, for driving people. Driving the vehicle on the freeway? Yes, dra driving on the freeway. And, and, oh, that's right, we talked about this. So, so what is the response to this? When you can't turn this off, you get angry. What if, what if somebody held you up to the edge of a cliff? You'd get mad at them, wouldn't you? You would kind of get enraged, wouldn't you? You would say, get me away from here. Get, and, and, right, you're, you're. So if you're in an environment with other people and you're overwhelmed by this agoraphobic panic that's mediated by vestibular dysfunction, you're, you're gonna get, at the very least, irritable. And you may experience progressive levels of irritability to include anger and rage. And we hear this all the time, folks, folks they just can't stand driving, they experience high levels of rage. This, this is very likely a pure vestibular problem. And if, if you send these folks to um, a good neuroautologist and occasionally a good neurooptometrist or an ENT doctor, and you subject them to thorough testing, not just a cursory test, but thorough testing where you sit them on a rotary chair, put them in goggles, spin them around, put them on a platform, and you subject them to the six different types of, of test conditions, I think chances are, meaning more likely than not, you'll find some abnormality. And it may be subtle, which means the examiner needs to be aware that this is physiologically plausible. But I think more often than not, you will find abnormalities. It, it's, we, we have a veteran in the States that's been helping uh, vets um, with this um, sort of as a, as a peer mentor. And this, this fellow is remarkable. The, the number of folks he's been able to get into testing and they come back with objective signs of, of brainstem, visual, or, or vestibular dysfunction, it's, it's remarkable. This, this guy's a better diagnostician than most doctors. And he just asks a handful of questions and he nails it almost every time. So vet, veterans know uh, this. It, it, it really is a fairly unique condition. Okay, let's just go through a few more. Um, many mefloquine patients, veterans, will report these, these weird spells. They call them spells. They, they call them uh, like mental shutdowns. Periods where it's just something they just can't, they just, and they feel exhausted afterwards. They don't know what's, what's up. They, they lose time, they feel confused, they feel fatigued, they can't process. And, and this can occur independent of these vestibular settings. So this, this, this can occur just sitting at home, relaxing. What is this? What is this? So when, when people complain of spells, mental shutdowns, you always think in the back of your mind, is this a seizure? Is, is this a deep brain seizure? Is, is this like some kind of absence seizure or a deep brain seizure? And if, if these episodes take on uh, a more uh, psychotic or confused uh, uh, character, if, if people are experiencing um, occasional psychotic uh, episodes where they experience hallucinations, for example, then, then yes, you're maybe thinking this is a temporal lobe seizure. So a, 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 in the part of your limbic system, deep brain, uh, that controls emotions, uh, it could be a seizure there. And the problem is this is so hard to recognize. You can go to your doctor and they can put electrodes on your head and they won't see anything because there's so much meat between that part of the brain and where the electrodes are recording, there's so much meat getting in the way that the signals are too weak. And the rest of the brain's functioning normal, but the deep part's not working right. Limbic, limbic seizures are, are notoriously difficult to diagnose. And so you almost have to diagnose them by history. Um, but it's very easy to mis, misattribute these symptoms to other things, and particularly in military uh, veterans. And then the more usual things, right? So in my experience, the most common diagnosis in people that are suffering from methylene poisoning is simply post-traumatic stress disorder, right? It's so easy to, to meet the diagnostic criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder if you are suffering only from the adverse effects of methylene. This has been written about in a few uh, places. And we'll, we'll go through the, the, the diagnostic criteria and you'll see. And then traumatic brain injury, right? Veterans. W w not only will veterans be ubiquitously assumed to be, to have been exposed to traumas, but veterans of recent wars will be ubiquitously assumed to have been exposed to concussive events. And I have reviewed countless charts where even though the veteran denies any history of use of shoulder fired weapons, of firing their own personal weapon extensively, or of being around any blast, the clinicians just assume on the basis of symptomatology that there must have been a concussive event. 
to explain the symptoms. And it, it's very, very common for clinicians to do this, to, to either take a, a mild sports injury that, that, that a veteran experienced and, and attribute everything to that, or to simply fabricate an event to parsimoniously explain the symptoms. And these, but these folks have never considered the effects of mefloquine. So with TBI, it's more of the cognitive and neurological symptoms that you would attribute to TBI. With PTSD, it's more of the psychiatric symptoms that you'd attribute to that. Suicidal ideation and suicide, um, and then other signs and symptoms. And recently, as, as I've become more and more confident in this disease presentation, as I, as I have reviewed literally hundreds of cases, I've become more and more confident that this list is even larger. And we'll just go through some of the things that I think we can plausibly link to mefloquine poisoning. So I hear a lot of reports of sleep apnea. Sleep apnea. There's two kinds of sleep apnea. The central apnea, meaning the brain is not sending a signal to breathe. And then there's obstructive apnea, meaning the brain is sending a signal to your diaphragm. Hey, go ahead and take a breath. Breath. But as the body goes to take a breath and exhale or inhale, there's some obstruction. There's a piece of meat stuck. And, and because you're asleep, you don't know to get it out of the way. So this piece of meat, usually it's a tongue, um, is blocking the flow of air. And so you have an apneic event. You try to breathe, but you don't. And that, that's an apnea. And if you have a certain number of those apneas an hour, you have a diagnosis of sleep apnea. And you get a sleep study and you, and you measure the number of apneas per hour. For the longest time, I couldn't figure out why the US military is seeing so much obstructive sleep apnea. If you are a young, healthy guy or girl, and you have a, a reasonable body mass index, and you didn't have sleep apnea before you deployed, and you suddenly come back and you have severe sleep apnea, what is going on? In the last 10 years, we've seen an epidemic, an epidemic of sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, that's almost always associated with PTSD symptoms. It, it's remarkable, and, and the sleep medicine community is beside itself trying to figure this out. It's, it's at the point now where the sleep medicine community just assumes that post-traumatic stress disorder is a risk factor for sleep apnea. How does this make any sense? This makes no sense. This makes absolutely no sense. Maybe, just maybe, what's going on is the same toxic process that caused chronic nightmares and chronic insomnia and chronic anxiety and panic that lead to a diagnosis of PTSD. That same neurotoxic process also injured a part of the brainstem that's responsible for keeping the tongue out of the way in the middle of the night. Now that, that, that is a bold conjecture. That is, admittedly, this is, <coughs> this is a bold theory. Um, but uh, there is a plausible pathophysiological mechanism by which this could happen. So in World War II, drugs of this class uh, were shown to target the hypoglossal nucleus. And the hypoglossal nucleus in the brainstem doesn't have a lot of responsibilities. It controls basically the tone of your tongue. It, it, it is involved with this part of your body. So it's plausible. It's plausible. I mean, admittedly, for those watching, saying, Dr. Nevin, you are a quack, it's plausible. It's plausible. And if, if we had proper animal studies where we gave mefloquine to some monkeys, if we saw injury to the hypoglossal nucleus after administration of mefloquine, it would be a lot more plausible, wouldn't it? So injury to the hypoglossal nucleus causing dysfunction in the genia glossus uh, muscle during, during REM sleep, uh, resulting in loss of tone, resulting in obstructive sleep apnea, this explains a lot of the epidemiology, and it's very parsimonious, it's very elegant, it's a very simple explanation. In science, if you can explain multiple things with one cause, that's better than trying to explain a bunch of different things with three or four different causes. It's the principle of parsimony or Occam's razor. And mefloquine is the very parsimonious explanation for a lot of things. Okay, so there's that. Um, dysphagia goes along with that, a sense of something getting stuck right here, a sense of inability to swallow. We see a lot of GERD um, in veterans. Uh, all of that can be maybe explained, in some case, it depends. But in some cases, the onset of that can be explained by a similar loss of tone and function in the vagus uh, nerve nucleus, the dorsal uh, motor horn of the vagus nerve in the, in the brainstem. And again, quinoline drugs have been found to be very toxic 
to the vagus nerve nuclei. What else does the vagus nerve nuclei control? The rest of the gut. And if you interfere with proper innervation of the gut, then all bets are off. Who knows what you're gonna see? Could you see chronic dysmotility, chronic diarrhea, chronic abdominal pain and cramping that's attributed to irritable bowel syndrome? Absolutely. And what do we consistently see Mefloquine veterans reporting? Yeah. IBS, all the time. We see it all the time. Doc, I, I soiled my pants, right? This is not normal for a 30 year old guy to be soiling his pants. Coming home from, from overseas, developing IBS, we see this all the time. And what are the acute symptoms of mefloquine poison, right? Nausea, emesis, abdominal pain, diarrhea. And it's often been assumed that these symptoms are due to the drug locally irritating the gut. But that makes no sense if the onset of the diarrhea and the onset of the emesis and the onset of the nausea is two days after taking the drug, which we commonly see, typically it's a day, but if we see the first onset of these symptoms two days after taking the pill, that pill has already left your body. The pill is acting as an irritant to the parts of your brain that innervate your gut. So this is what, this is what we think is going on. That this drug is acting as a central neurotoxicant that's causing gastrointestinal symptoms. I mean, if, the, if, if we can confirm this with some animal model studies, this will be huge because it'll show, it'll actually help us understand gastric dysmotility. It'll help us understand a lot of, of, of neurogenic gastrointestinal problems. So what else? Um, uh, we see a lot of neuroendocrine disorders, uh, low T, for example. Um, depending, on, depending on the circumstances, that's also plausible because this drug is neurotoxic to various parts of the, the brainstem that are, that are responsible for uh, hormonal control, neuroendocrine functions. So uh, it's, it's entirely possible that hormonal imbalances could be linked back to neurotoxicity um, from this drug. Paresthesias, tingling, tingling in the face, tingling in the fingers, tingling in the toes. Again, this is all mediated very likely by dysfunction in areas of the brainstem responsible for uh, processing signals from those areas. I think that's enough. Right? Yeah. Does anyone else have, have symptoms they propose or do this drug? Did I miss anything? It will be sensitivity to sunlight. Oh, right. Thank you. Visions. Thank you. Central visual disturbances. So um, the eyes are controlled by uh, three cranial nerve uh, nuclei. They do different things. They move the eyes together. They move them, uh, they, they move them in sync. Um, they move your eyes together. They move your eyes apart. They change your focus from near to far. A common complaint among mefloquine veterans is they have difficulty with accommodation, changing accommodation. They have difficulty focusing on a far target and then quickly focusing on a near target. Accommodative dysfunction is, is, is not uncommonly reported. That's a central process. That's mediated by the brainstem. And a good neurooptometrist or a good neuroophthalmologist uh, will occasionally be able to recognize that and other symptoms of central visual dysfunction. Photophobia is an example of that. And, and how photophobia could be centrally mediated. It depends on the circumstances, but, but uh, your, your pupillary response is mediated by your, your brainstem. So that's one plausible explanation, but there are many more. Um, and then more complicated visual problems. A, a lot of folks say they have a hard time reading, words bounce around, they have a hard time focusing on reading tasks. That's probably not brainstem, that's probably the visual tracks. That's a slightly higher up uh, in the central nervous system that's being affected. Um, but I, Many, many, many such cases that I'm aware of uh, that are purely, purely central. Okay, what, what, what else did I miss? What else is associated? Tinnitus. With? Oh, of course, tinnitus. Okay, so, so tinnitus and subjective hearing change. Uh, this acusia, I guess, uh, a sense that you just can't hear as well. And it's, it's not an objective hearing dysfunction. If, if you do the standard tone tests, you probably won't see a dropout. It's not military-related noise uh, 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 um, induced dysfunction. It's, it's a subjective, it's subjective hearing loss. And you'll very often pass the hearing recognition tests. The, the audiologist reads some words aloud and you can, in, in the standard environment like that, you can usually interpret it, but it's in, it's in, it's in audiologically busy environments. It's where there's a lot of noise going on that, that mefloquine folks have a lot of problems. It, it's not just a tinnitus, it's, it's almost a, it's, it's, it's hyperacusis is what it is. It's a sensitivity to certain types of noise. 
It's a sensitivity to certain types of noise. It's just very irritating to folks. And, and that's, again, all plausibly mediated by the, the brainstem, the cochlear nerve, the cochlear uh, nuclei that control inputs from, from the ear. And, and the good news is this stuff can be picked up on sensitive testing, audiological testing. You can often pick up uh, abnormalities in the brainstem. Not always, but, but sometimes. What are other symptoms that I miss? Is it safe to say that almost any neurological system is going to be affected simply so, because uh, it is a neurotoxin? Yeah. So in general, so ask any neurologist, what are the presenting signs and symptoms of multiple sclerosis? And you'll get a, ha, let me, let me tell you. And they'll rattle off a list. So imagine if there was no diagnosis of multiple sclerosis and someone presents to their doctor and they have all of these symptoms. They're going to be diagnosed with any number of different disorders, including if the doctor doesn't believe that this is plausible, then you're going to get diagnosed with conversion disorder, somatoform disorder, malingering, right? If, if there's no plausible explanation for all these diverse signs and symptoms, your doctor's going to say, well, the, the easiest explanation is that you're just crazy, right? It happens all the time. Uh, but once the pathophysiology of multiple sclerosis became apparent to the medical community, and we have scanners that can show the various lesions, then they say, oh, well, of course, this, this accounts for everything. So instead of being told you have a psychiatric problem and three or four different neurological problems, <coughs> you're told you have multiple sclerosis, and that accounts for everything, right? And it's the same with methylene poisoning. Before the medical community recognized, before the medical community recognized this, then they're going to say, well, either you're crazy or you have all of these different disorders. Because how else is this possible? You don't have multiple sclerosis, so what else could it be? But once, once we inform the medical community that there is a, a, a very plausible pathophysiology behind all of these, these diverse psychiatric and neurologic signs and symptoms, then instead of being told you have anxiety disorder and tinnitus and you have paresthesias and you have this and that, They'll just say, well, you have chronic quinoline and cephalon. And that accounts for everything. So, so th there, are, there are very few um, functions that uh, could not, could, might, that will not be plausibly affected by this poisoning. Once you get the brainstem involved pathophysiologically, like I said, all bets are off. Because the brainstem is so critical. It's this tiny little area and it controls so many functions. And this is the one drug that targets the brainstem. There is no other substance that I'm aware of that has this focal neurotoxic process. And that's why this is a disease. This is a unique disease. That, 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 that what you see with this class of drug is not seen with, with other drugs. This is a unique disorder. So this is, this is, probably, uh, this is probably still reasonably realistic. If, if you imagine the severity of symptoms on the vertical axis and time on this axis, you have the prodrome where you begin to notice symptoms. You may not attribute them to anything. You may attribute them to your environment or to a pre-existing condition. But over time, the severity of these conditions will be such that you either seek medical attention or you realize it is the drug and you stop taking the drug. Something will happen to, to stop the exposure to the toxicant, right? At which point, hopefully, because the toxicant has been stopped, the symptoms will decline a little bit, we hope. Now, the problem with this is that, is that neurotoxicants exhibit a, a property called coasting, meaning if you stop the exposure, it's possible that the severity of symptoms will continue to worsen over time because the, the toxicant is still making its way into the brain. It's lipid soluble. It's not leaving anytime soon. The toxic injury will build upon itself. So the injury could get worse even after discontinuing the drug. And, and hopefully when you discontinue the drug and after the drug starts to leave the body, it's not doing any new damage, but the damage that's already been done is not going away. And my experience is that the symptomatology will decline somewhat in severity. We, we usually don't see, for example, persistence of psychotic symptoms, right? If someone experiences psychosis, typically the psychosis will end when, when you discontinue the drug or a few months afterwards. And maybe that's because you're medicated. But chronic psychosis is, is it, it's, it's not unheard of, but it's, it's I would say, rare. Um, so there are some symptoms that abate, but other symptoms clearly don't, right? Other symptoms clearly don't. The insomnia, the nightmares, um, the anxiety, the panic, and arguably those get worse in some cases. And, and you experience it worse when you come home. And that could just be because you're finally home. 
and you realize the, the, the contrast, you realize this is not normal. Like when I was overseas, you might have attributed it to your environment, but when you're home and you're still experiencing panic, that's not normal. So it, 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 that could be the reason. But then other symptoms, I do think they occur later, like the dizziness, the vertigo, the tinnitus, this stuff tends to be reported later on. And that could be because it just takes longer exposure to the neurotoxicant for that to manifest. It could be maybe those centers are less sensitive to the toxicant and the nightmares is an early warning sign, but the dizziness is one of those late effects that indicates irreversible neurotoxicity. I'm not, I'm not sure, but generally we see the dizziness and so on a, a little bit later. And then this is, this is the unanswered question, right? What is the long-term trajectory of this? What is the long-term trajectory? So, so we have a, a, a previously healthy cohort of 20-year-old men, for the most part, and, and a few women, they were given this drug in the prime of their life, in their 20s, and it's been, what, 25 years, right? So you guys are 40 and 50 now. And when does chronic neuro, when, when do neurodegenerative changes start to manifest? When do you start to see early cognitive impairment, the early signs of Alzheimer's disease developing, right? Well, you're gonna start to see that, worst case, in the 40s and 50s, the 50s typically. So we're approaching the point and things like Parkinson's, right? You see that typically later in life. So we're approaching the point in the natural history of this epidemic where if problems start developing, it's gonna be very easy to attribute them to natural causes, right? Neuro various neurodegenerative problems or mild cognitive impairment. And, and I don't have great faith that government funded researchers are going to assess methylocone exposure as a covariant in these studies. So just like acute symptoms are easy to misattribute to PTSD and TBI, chronic symptoms may be similarly misattributed to other conditions. This is an easy epidemic to miss. This is an iceberg and it's, it's just, just, you see a little bit poking out of the ocean and there's no moon and you know the Titanic is barreling right at it. It's very easy to miss, but it's there. There's a big iceberg of morbidity. There's a question from the In the civilian audience. population that's never had exposure to uh, the battlefield, yeah. they're having the exact same symptoms, yeah. and their doctors would be not not even looking for... Right, yeah, so, the, like so the question was, well, what about civilians that are not uh, plausibly candidates for TBI or PTSD? They get diagnosed with bipolar disorder, major depression, um, generalized anxiety disorder. And they don't have uh, an organized body advocating for them. So they get lost. They get lost in the shuffle. Typically, if you're affected by mefloquine as a young adult traveling, you become disabled to the point where you cannot function in society, you can't earn a living. In the states, you lose access to medical care as a result. You become homeless in the worst case. You lose your ability to fight for yourself and nobody hears about this. It's very rare. You know, Peace Corps uh, volunteers that are affected by uh, mefloquine, they get nothing. They get nothing. Uh, and many of them are unemployable because they can't function in society with this constellation of, of signs and symptoms, this chronic disability. So they don't pursue the medical care that would get these definitive diagnoses that would make a good case study. They just suffer in, in silence. They, they, they suffer unbeknownst to us. And, and when the Peace Corps sends out a survey saying, hey, how was your mefloquine experience? They never get that email. They never get that mail because the last thing they're gonna do is update their mailing address with the Peace Corps. Now, if they're homeless or if they're hospitalized in a psychiatric institution, they're not gonna get that survey. So the Peace Corps thinks that everything's fine. Now, it's classic selection bias. <clears throat> Uh, in the military, there's less of that. And again, this is why we focus on the military, because there's less selection bias in the military. Homeless veterans are gonna be cared for, right? Folks that are struggling who are veterans, the government cares about them. We're gonna make sure they get seen. So it's easier for us to track down the folks that have been hurt as veterans. But un undoubtedly, undoubtedly, the biggest burden of morbidity from this is not here in, in Canada, it's not in the States, it's not in military veterans, it's not in travelers. It's in the millions of people worldwide that are given high doses of this drug to treat malaria. But there's no way we can assess that burden. We don't speak their language. They don't have the same conception of psychiatric illness that we do. 
they don't believe that drugs cause that. They think that in some cases it's, you know, it's, it's God made you crazy, right? Their, their, their conception of psychiatric illness is so fundamentally different from ours that we can't study it in a reliable and valid way. We need to develop a whole new field of science to study the psychiatric effects of these drugs in malaria endemic populations. And the good malariologists will readily admit they have no clue how these drugs are affecting their populations. The good ones will. The, the bad ones will say, well, they didn't tell us they were experiencing nightmares, so the drug is safe. Well, did you ask them? Do, do, do they even know that drugs can cause nightmares? No. Well, then why did you think they would report it? Many, many problems. Many, many problems. The, the, the field suffers from uh, what we call uh, a lack of validity uh, in the scientific community. Okay, but the, the good news, the good news is that while we still have lots of work to do in these populations, in the military community, we're starting to recognize this. There are more and more publications describing this syndrome, this disorder, this disease in military populations. Uh, I had this remarkable coup where, thanks to uh, a, fr a friendly colleague of mine, I published this chapter, Mephalicone and Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, in the U.S. Army's very textbook of military medicine. Thank you very much for <laughs> helping me with that. So, you know, a remarkable coup. Um, have a couple chapters where we describe this 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 disorder, syndrome disorder, um, and the word the word is getting out. The word is getting out, and I think we're at the point now where the medical community has enough that they can figure this out on their own. And and this now we're going to talk about screening. Look, how, how do we advance this medically? So I published this. In Federal Practitioner, it's a, it's a journal that goes out to all the VA hospitals in the States. We, we have VA hospitals, where if you're a veteran, you get your care for free in the States. And I, I, I sent this out. And this is basically teaching US federal doctors how to screen their vets for this history of mefloquine exposure. And it's not mefloquine exposure. It's symptomatic mefloquine exposure. And this, this is what we'll talk about here. So, so the exposure of interest is not, did you ever take this pill? That's not the exposure of interest. We're, we're actually doing the government a favor because we're reducing the number of people that we think are at risk. Uh, here in Canada, what, what did we think? We thought maybe 40, 50,000 Canadian veterans ha have had mefloquine exposure. It could, it could be much more, it could, it could be at, less. Their number at 19,000 and change, and then we know some are not reported. Yeah. Nice so let, let's say minimum 20,000. Minimum 20,000, it could, it could be up to 40,000. It's, it's in the tens of thousands, certainly. So, so Canadian veterans have been exposed to mefloquine in the tens of thousands. Now the good news for the Canadian government at BAC is it's not every single one of those veterans that we think are at risk of this condition. It's the veterans that were exposed, but then experienced symptoms during use of the drug. In my experience, I can probably count on this, there's no other plausible cause, they have objective findings, but they just, they don't remember having the insomnia. They don't remember having the nightmares. This is very rare. This is very rare. I, I will readily concede this if I'm deposed in the future. It's very rare. It's, it's not impossible because if someone is amnestic, if someone is having a, a bad memory, they're obviously not gonna remember the symptoms that they had. So, so it's possible that people that had very acute mefloquine poisoning are unreliable historians. And if you ask one of their buddies, they'll say the guy was floridly psychotic. He doesn't remember that? It's possible. But in general, people do remember. They say, you know, yeah, the, the insomnia started right away, the nightmares started right away, and now they find themselves chronically disabled. So that person has a history of symptomatic exposure. Now, many people will say, well, doc, of course I had symptoms while on the drug. I was deployed. Of course I had insomnia. Of course I had nightmares. I was being shot at. And I said, so then I'll say, well, did you discontinue the drug? Because the instructions have been all along, if you have symptoms, discontinue the drug. Oh, no, I didn't discontinue the drug. Well, then how can you be sure that those symptoms you were experiencing weren't actually due to the drug? You can't be. You can't expect soldiers to do their own causality assessment, right, and determine in the midst of a deployment if the anxiety they're experiencing is due to the drug or due to causes. And that's why the instructions say discontinue the drug at the onset of symptoms because the drug company is recognizing that you cannot be expected to do a causality assessment. So symptomatic exposure is, it's a, it's, it's a very sensitive concept 
and, and for the scientists watching and for the, the audience, what you, what you don't want in screening for exposure is you don't wanna miss anyone. You don't wanna miss anyone. You, you'd much rather get a false positive. You'd much rather falsely say someone has the exposure of interest than to miss someone. And, and you'll take care of those false positives later on. But as an initial step, you want a, a screening test with a high sensitivity. And our process for screening for symptomatic mephalone exposure, we think, has exceptionally high sensitivity, meaning we're very unlikely to miss anyone. And granted, some people will, will answer positive to the instrument, to, to our screening method, who don't have a problem from mephalone. But at least the doctor will keep it in mind during the evaluation, and that's the key. That's what we want. That's what we want to have happen. And let, let me just show you a few examples. So th these are some vignettes, and for the clinicians listening, and for folks in the audience, just think about this. So, so this is back in uh, 2003. A 33-year-old male. Uh, he was an Army intelligence officer with a top secret clearance, and he had no medical history. This guy was rock solid, top secret special forces dude. He deployed to Iraq with an SF team as an intelligence guy uh, early on in the war. And on the first or second night there, after he'd been taking mefloquine for a few weeks, he, he presented to combat stress, complaining of the most vivid, horrific nightmares. He was experiencing visual hallucinations of his team members appearing to him. It actually wasn't a hallucination. It was a visual illusion, technically. Uh, but we'll call them hallucinations for simplicity. Imagine talking to someone and picturing them as, as a mangled corpse. A, a mangled corpse talking to you, right? Kind of like one of these augmented reality things you can do on your phone now. But this was his actual reality. He was experiencing florid symptoms of psychosis uh, that in the context of his deployed environment was mistaken for an acute stress reaction, a combat stress reaction. He experienced panic. He thought his buddies were out to get him. And sure enough, after a while, they were out to get him because his buddies thought he was crazy. They took away his weapon. The worst thing you can do to someone who's paranoid and thinks people are out to kill him is take away their weapon because it makes them even more paranoid. He was confused. He began to be uh, dizzy. And they, his commander, his commander or someone else in the chain of command, they went up to him and said, look, you gotta, you gotta get your S together. You gotta, you gotta get it together. You're, you're at war. You know, you're acting like a coward. You need to man up and get your battle rattle back on and you know, go out on deployment with us. And he said, I can't, I can't. I'm freaking out, I don't know what's wrong with me. I just wanna go home, I just wanna go home. The guy was yellow, right? In the eyes of his teammates, this guy was just a coward. He was a coward in the eyes of his teammates. And they were gonna charge him with cowardice. And the news at the time talked about how this guy was facing the death penalty for being a coward. And all he was suffering from was a bout of mefloquine poisoning. All the symptoms that are clearly listed in the product label, he was suffering from. Nobody ever asked him, hey, you know, you're taking mefloquine? Could this be a mefloquine reaction? If they had, they wouldn't have had to embarrass the unit and cause this, this big international incident. The reason he was saved, the reason he wasn't charged with cowardice and sentenced to death was because he was evaluated by an ear, nose, and throat doctor, a doctor with specialized experience evaluating central causes of dizziness. And he was found to have central vestibular dysfunction. He was found to have findings on careful examination that were non-volitional, that you couldn't fake, that were clear and unequivocal evidence of brainstem dysfunction. And in the context of what was known about mefloquine at the time, the charges were quietly dropped and he was discharged from the military with a rating for post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, the question is, does he have post-traumatic stress disorder, or is he just suffering the chronic effects of mefloquine? Can you get post-traumatic stress disorder from hallucinating a mangled talk talking corpse? Or do you actually have to see a mangled corpse to get post-traumatic stress disorder? Now, in his case, on the drive-in, he just happened to have saw a mangled corpse at the side of the road, and very likely that, that memory in the context of, of his developing psychosis informed his subsequent hallucinations and it, it manifest in his nightmares. But if he wasn't under the influence of mefloquine, would he have developed as strong a reaction to what he saw? Was his reality altered by the effects of mefloquine? Would he have ever been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder if not for 
the altered sensory experience he had as a result of methylcon. So if you if you were to interview this guy, and you were to say, did you ever? So a new psychiatrist evaluating this fellow, if you say, oh, so did you ever take methylcon? Oh yes, I I took methylcon. So during your use of methylcon, did you experience certain symptoms? Oh yes, doc, I did. Let me tell you what I experienced. So that fellow has symptomatic mefloquine exposure. And it's our hope that in the evaluation of veterans at risk of mefloquine poisoning, that administering this, this screening to veterans will now inform the doctor that they have to keep mefloquine poisoning in mind in the differential diagnosis. And you can see in this case how critical that would be, right? Mm -hmm. The ENT doctor knew to look for evidence of central vestibular dysfunction. A subsequent psychiatrist might not uh, treat this the same way if they think it's actually methylcon and they might get a different diagnosis, right? This fellow also has a 30% rating for vestibular dysfunction secondary to methylcon. So his VA paperwork back from 2003 actually acknowledges permanent disability from methylcon. So this is back in, in 2003. And sure enough, what else does he have, right? He has ratings for GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, and IBS. It's interesting, isn't it? Yes? Uh, what's another common name for GERD? Um, acid reflux? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah acid reflux. Yeah, acid, acid reflux. So, so, so the pathophysiology of GERD is that this little sphincter here uh, is, isn't working right. Like, that's maybe over here. So, so the stomach acid is bubbling up your esophagus when it really shouldn't. That, that should kind of seal off, and the acid down here should, shouldn't go up here. Um, but let's, let's say the tone, the muscle tone is not right for whatever reason. Then it's possible maybe you'll just get more reflux. So it's, it's perfectly plausible that, that GERD has a neurogenic uh, etiology in this case, the same way that IBS, the excessive motility, uh, has a neurogenic uh, disorder. And we, we need to do epi studies to see if there is this association. I think there is. I think there is. Uh, it's not, I, I think we see it with sleep, sleep apnea a lot more, but you guys are the ones telling me, I came home from wherever and I've never had the same bowel habit. And that, that just doesn't make any sense outside this context. It's not a parasite. It's not some infectious agent. You guys have all been worked up for every parasite known to man. Your tests are 100% clear, and they always have been. So what else is it, right? It, it, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So this is where we are today. We're, we're at the point where we want doctors, clinicians, to start screening for symptomatic mefloquine exposure. Uh, and the recommendation is that all veterans of the Gulf War and the post 9-11 era be screened. So going back basically to late 80s, early 90s, we think everyone should be screened. Now we've developed an instrument. In, in medicine, if you develop something and you give it a fancy name with an acronym and you stick a couple numbers in there, then people take it more seriously. If, if it, it's, it's a medical thing, right? So, so a, a lot of my colleagues, they spend their whole life developing instruments. Well, I have a doctoral degree from the Department of Mental Health Johns Hopkins, I know how to develop instruments, that's what they taught me to do. So I developed an instrument, the White River Mefloquine instrument, or the Remy Two question. And it's the first one we've developed, we'll develop more in the future. This is, this is designed by intent to have very high sensitivity. And if you look at the instrument, you may say, well, of course they're gonna answer yes to that. That's the point. If, if there's any chance that they have symptomatic mefloquine exposure, we want them to answer yes. So that's the point, this is by design. Um, and what this is, is it's not a clinical tool. It's not a diagnostic tool, it's not a legal tool. It, this is not a instrument designed to, to, to um, finalize a conclusion about clinical stuff. What, what this does is it tells you if there's exposure of interest, if there's exposure of interest, if they were exposed to, potentially exposed to a neurotoxic. And then only if they screen positive, only if they screen positive, should you take a mefloquin history? And, and this, is, this, is, this is where we hope the clinician will develop experience. So if someone screens positive on this instrument, it's possible that what they're suffering from is mefloquine poisoning. But to tease out what could be due to mefloquine and what could be due to PTSD and what could be due to TBI, this requires the clinician to ask questions. And the questions that you'll ask will depend on the context. So I can't tell you right now what, what questions to ask. The clinician has to understand what methylcone poisoning can look like, what symptoms it can cause, what kind of chronic disability it can lead to, and the clinician should, should go back in history 
and ask the veteran, so when did these symptoms begin? What, what, how, how was your health before you took mefloquine? Oh, you were fine? You never had any psychiatric symptoms? You never had any neurological symptoms? Okay, great. We know that you took mefloquine, or we think you took mefloquine, and we know that you experienced certain symptoms during your use of mefloquine. Tell me about that continued use. How long did you continue to take mefloquine for in the presence of these symptoms? How many weeks of mefloquine did you take after first experiencing these horrific nightmares of you killing your child and enjoying it, for example, which is a story I hear quite often. Uh, how many weeks did you experience those nightmares before you realized it might have been the drug and stuff? Oh, doc, I knew it was the drug right away. I had to keep taking the drug. They wouldn't let me stop. Uh, they told me the dreams would go away. Okay, so what other symptoms did you experience? Well, you know, the nightmares would wake me up, but then I found I couldn't get to sleep by about the second or third week. I just couldn't get to sleep at all. I started drinking to get to sleep. Okay, when did that happen? And how long has that continued? Doc, I haven't had a good night's sleep for 25 years. I have to drink myself to sleep every night. Oh, when was your first uh, tick? When was your first uh, combat uh, experience? Oh, Doc, that was two months later. I'd already been experiencing these nightmares and insomnia for two months before we had our first contact. Oh, well, what other symptoms did you have in that time? Doc, I was paranoid. I thought everyone was out to get me. I was dizzy. I, I started to get confused. I started to forget my friend's name. You take a mefloquine history. You, you take a focus history focused on the symptoms that we know are linked to mefloquine and you, and you link them in time to use of the drug. Because, because if, if the individual is reporting all of these symptoms in the months before their first plausible traumatic stressor, then is it PTSD? And if they're already experiencing dizziness and tinnitus before the concussive event that you've assumed, is it traumatic brain injury? And, and the patient will tell you, the veteran will tell you, if you just listen, if you take a, a, a mefloquine history. And here, here's the second vignette. You can see, you can maybe, maybe do this uh, as I share the vignette. So this is a, a naval officer. He's 32 uh, years old. Again, he has no past medical history. Um, and he's, de he's deployed on a ship uh, off East Africa in 2009. And, and during his deployment, he experiences these intense uh, nightmares and anxiety. And it, these nightmares have nothing to do with any sort of, of combat exposure. They're just weird, morbid, abnormal uh, nightmares. And he, he subsequently develops disequilibrium and confusion. Now you may say, well, you're on a ship. Of course you're gonna have disequilibrium. But sailors have their sea legs. They pretty much know how to stay balanced uh, on a ship. Now later on, Later on, during his deployment, after all of this, he experiences uh, enemy fire, which is not abnormal, right? That's why we deploy, because they're dangerous areas. That's why we send folks overseas. And when he came home, all of his symptoms were attributed to post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. But when they examined him at an ENT clinic with all of the specialized tests, he had this abnormal vestibular ocular uh, reflex. And the doctors, they're good doctors, they said, this is central. This is a brainstem uh, abnormality. And he has all of these symptoms, some of which you could see could be easily attributed to PTSD and some are, are more attributed to the, the central vestibulopathy. So what's the diagnosis here? Right? Well, if he was symptomatic with all of these symptoms before the enemy contact, and we can attribute the central vestibulopathy to the drug, the most parsimonious explanation for his condition is a single diagnosis, a single diagnosis of quinism neuropsychiatric quinism, or chronic quinoline encephalopathy, not post-traumatic stress disorder. And here's the problem. The problem is that mefloquine exposure confounds the diagnosis of these two conditions. And remember the first slide I showed you? This is what the military doctors were saying back in 2012, <laughs> that, that mefloquine confounds the diagnosis and management of PTSD and TBI. So I'm gonna give you uh, an epi lesson, an epidemiology lesson. Normally, you have to go to Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health to be taught about confounding as well as I'm going to explain it to you now. But this is, this is the, 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 the nutshell of confounding. By the way, what time is it? Ten to four. What time is it? Ten to four. Oh, my God. I've been talking all day. I'm really sorry. About that. Why didn't one of you tell me I was talking so long? I, my students do the same thing. They just sit there quietly, and I'm talking. And I miss lunch hour. We're going to stop in 10 minutes. 
And then I said we would get out of here at 4.30 or 4. So, so we'll spend the last half hour talking about other stuff. Okay, I apologize for going over. I'm, I'm admittedly long-winded. Uh, so confounding is, is a huge problem in clinical medicine and it's a huge problem in, in research. It occurs when there's an, another explanation, another causal explanation for how you can get the outcome of interest. In this case, the anxiety, the nightmares, the insomnia. And it happens only when there's correlation between the exposure of interest, mefloquin, and the thing that you've been attributing the symptoms to, is correlation. So let's, let's give an example here. So it, with PTSD, we think it's exposure to stress that causes insomnia, nightmares, depression, and anxiety. The theory is that, oh, the reason you have insomnia, nightmares, depression, anxiety is because you saw terrible things. You were exposed to combat stress. And we know that exposure to combat stress causes these symptoms. Easy, right? Easy. What else can cause these symptoms? You were overseas, you come home, you have nightmares, you saw bad things. The diagnosis is simple. Psychiatrists and primary care doctors will give you the diagnosis in a 10 minute visit, won't they? Because it's so simple. Well, guess what? It's not that simple. And I have bad news for the PTSD research community. All of your research over the past 25 years is invalid because you have failed to control for a critical confounder. If there's another exposure that can also cause those symptoms and it's correlated with the exposure that you've been attributing those symptoms to. You have what we call in epidemiology a classic confounder, and if you fail to measure and control for that confounder, your research is invalid. It's invalid. It has zero validity. Because you cannot prove to me that all of these things that you have assumed were due to the stressor aren't in fact due to this confounder. And at no time over the last 25 years, has anyone that's been doing research among veterans on PTSD, have they ever measured this critical confounder that goes by the name of symptomatic mefloquine exposure? Because who gets mefloquine? The folks that are deployed overseas where they're gonna be exposed to stressors. And what do we know mefloquine causes? All of these things. So this is a huge problem. I really cannot overstate the magnitude of the problem that the military research community is facing. All of the papers are junk. They meant well, the researchers meant well, they did, they did the best they could, but they failed to control for a critical confounder. And they cannot prove that the effect they're commenting on isn't in fact due to methylene. So how do, how do we extricate ourselves from this? Well, first of all, we have to show that we're onto something here. We have to convince them that you know this confounding is real. So what, what do we know that mefloquine causes that traumatic stressors don't cause? They don't cause dizziness, right? Poor memory, not really. There are other symptoms that we know are, are more likely to be caused by mefloquine than to combat stressors. And this is what we're seeing. This is what we're seeing in the research community, in the clinical community. Researchers are starting to realize that the, the symptoms that have been attributed to stressors, it just doesn't fit. There's some missing factor that accounts for the weird symptom profile they're experiencing. They're realizing themselves there's some missing factor. And I think in many cases that missing factor will be mefloquine. So there's a reason why our organization is headquartered in White River Junction, Vermont. White River Junction, Vermont is not just a pleasant, pretty place in the hills, it's very quiet. White River Junction, Vermont just happens to be the home of the VA's National Center for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. So, so in due course, I expect we will be working very closely with them um, because we will, we will have to disentangle 25 years of confounding. Uh, and, and being co-located with them, uh, I think, will we'll serve that purpose very well. Uh, and and we'll, we'll figure this out eventually, but it's going to be a huge problem. It's going to be a huge problem. So these are the diagnostic criteria for PTSD. Criterion A diagnostic criteria are those stressors, right? You saw dead bodies, you were in danger of being killed, right? The, 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 the big criterion A stressors. Is watching a horror movie a criterion A stressor? No, is watching a movie of someone getting killed a criterion A stressor? No, you can't get 
PTSD from that. Is hallucinating a dead body a criterion A stressor? No. I've had psychiatrists tell me, but, but Dr. Nevin, they do have PTSD. The trauma they experienced was the trauma of being poisoned by methylene. Oh. <laughs> and I say, really? Oh. Really? Really? Like, think Actually, outside the box. Sure. Think outside the box. Actually, what we're finding with a lot of guys have been poisoned by methylene. Yeah. The very nature of the nightmares they were having yeah. are, are extremely horrific. There's so, there's an easy way to get to the bottom of that. I, I talked to a fellow and I said, look, you think you have both methylene poisoning and PTSD, right? Yes. You know which symptoms are due to methylene and which aren't, right? Yes. I said, you experienced bad combat trauma. Yes, yes, absolutely. What would you rather have? Would you rather experience, would you rather endure a night of your mephloquin nightmares, which started weeks before your combat trauma? Would you rather experience that or the traumatic event that led to your diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder? Would you rather be back in that firefight where you saw your buddy die or would you rather endure a mephloquin nightmare? Doc, I would much rather be back in combat. I would much rather be back in that firefight because the my methylical nightmares are worse. We hear this all the time. We hear this all the time. My point is, to diagnose post-traumatic stress disorder, you need to have all of these symptoms, right? But what you can usually do is you can figure out which symptoms are plausibly due to combat and which symptoms are more plausibly due to the methylical. And if you end up not being able to diagnose PTSD based on purely trauma or stressor-related symptoms, if you're having to attribute mephloquine nightmares as part of this diagnosis, maybe it's not PTSD. And in fact, the new diagnosis of PTSD excludes the diagnosis if the symptoms are due to the effects of a substance. The new diagnosis of PTSD specifically rules out the diagnosis if the symptoms are due to the effects of a medication. And what medication can cause symptoms that might be mistaken for PTSD? Mephloquine. I can't think of a single other one. And it just ends up that the, the, the DSM-5 came out in 2013, around the time that the authors of that chapter were becoming aware of mephloquine poisoning. So we, we don't know if it actually informed their, their thinking, but I suspect it did. So what we are on the verge of, I think, is recognition of a new disease called quinism, or chronic quinoline encephalopathy, right? That is, is common, we've seen it throughout history. It's seen in cases of poisoning by, by pretty much every drug of the quinoline class, going back to quinine that was used in the Victorian era, and including the new drug to fenequin that we see today. All of the side effects from this drug have been attributed by the drug sponsors to PTSD. A lot of these guys, the most stressful thing they did when they were on deployment was walk up a hill and they develop PTSD symptoms and they say, well, we know that deployment is associated with development of PTSD, so of course they have PTSD. A complete lack of intellectual curiosity. Um, but what, what, what else do we expect? Because they're just following the script. It worked with mefloquine, it worked with chloroquine, so why not? We know that these drugs are neurotoxic and they cause dysfunction in the limbic system and, and brainstem. And we know that the signs and symptoms seen in this disorder reflect the localization of this pattern of injury uh, perfectly. This is an emerging disorder. You can't go to your doctor and say, I want to be diagnosed with quinism because they'll look at you funny. This is going to take five-ish years, maybe 10 years, to become a, a common term. Uh, but that's the whole point of our organization is to raise awareness of this condition. But if we are successful, it's going to be huge, right? It's going to be huge. Folks in clinic, that see these symptoms should think about the diagnosis. If, if you have patients with these symptoms and they have plausible exposure, then you need to screen them for a history of symptomatic mefloquine exposure. And, and if they have a history of symptomatic exposure and a mefloquine history suggests the possibility that their current symptoms could be drug related, then how do you take care of these patients? So, Someone with this, this, this range of signs and symptoms, they could have a life-threatening disorder, right? They, they could have multiple sclerosis. They could have a brain tumor. So in general, you want to refer them to neurology to rule out a, a more acute sinister process. Now, generally, this is clear by history because they've been suffering this for 20 years. 
and the records are full of, of these kinds of evaluations already. But, but a new patient presenting for the first time with these symptoms, they probably need to be seen by a neurologist. And typically, neurologic exam is pretty unremarkable. The neurologists do a fairly cursory examination of the cranial nerves. They don't see much wrong. They may do a Romberg, they may do a stressed Romberg. They'll say you're fine, but you know you're not fine, but they'll interpret it as being fine because they don't see a plausible pathophysiology in many cases. I've had a few good neurologists say, I did notice subtle abnormalities and I took that very seriously. But my experience is most neurologists are very skeptical of this still. And they're used to dealing with tumors, they're used to dealing with, with very severe, obvious neuropathology. And this is much more subtle than they're used to dealing with. Who sees it, who recognizes this, are the subspecialists, the ENTs, the neuroautologists. When these patients report dizziness and they take a careful dizziness history, that makes them curious. They say, wait a second, this is interesting. This, this, is, this is not normal. They stick them in a rotary chair, they put the goggles on, they spin them around. Uh, sometimes they spin them in all directions. They watch how their eyes flicker and move in response to movement and light. Um, and they say, you have brainstem dysfunction. So this is expensive testing and it's not available very much in Canada, but uh, hopefully the vestibular testing that is available here, the docs will be able to do much of this and still recognize the, the plausible signs and symptoms of, of mefloquine poisoning. Um, the same with vision testing, right? Complex, this is not, this is not going to an ophthalmologist. This is, not go, this is not going to an optometrist. This is going to a neuro-ophthalmologist or a neuro-optometrist, someone that specializes in visual disorders caused by abnormalities in the central nervous system. If, if you, oh, well, the, op, the, op, the optometrist says my vision was fine. That's not good enough. You need to see a neuro whatever to get this. And these specialists are rare in Canada. In the States, we have a whole bunch because you pay for it out of pocket usually, but up here, this is, this is rare. Sleep medicine, if someone's reporting insomnia, then you have to rule out uh, obstructive sleep apnea as the cause. And again, obstructive sleep apnea, could very well be due to this uh, condition. And then folks that complain of, of neurocognitive problems, right? I just can't focus, I, I, I just, I'm not, I'm not as smart as I used to be, I'm forgetful. Neuropsychological testing can often um, reveal focal abnormalities. Or if, someone, if someone's lucky enough to have prior neuropsychological testing, or have been shown to have been an A student, obviously at the top of their percentiles, and they come back and they have 20, 30th percentile, and there's no other plausible explanation for this, then that could be mefloquine. And then speech-language pathology. They're experts in the proper functioning of this part of the body, right? Everything from, from the oropharynx down so to, to mid-esophagus. So if the speech-language pathologists make you swallow some stuff and, and the swallowing looks a little funny on x-ray, or they look in your throat with a scope and they see that your vocal cords or the muscles aren't really working the right way, that could be evidence of, of, uh, of uh, uh, brainstem dysfunction. So that is a very long-winded uh, master course in mefloquine poisoning. So we will stop the broadcast, and we're going to have a private session now for the remainder of our time. Thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us. And we'll pick this up again later.